info here about the monarch butterfly, which are super cool. We love them, and I'm sure you will all love them by the end of this as well. So, I'm going to throw some big words at you. Uh, so, to look at the classification of butterflies, uh, they are animals, so they are in the kingdom uh, Animalia. That's the big fancy name for it. And if we go lower than that to the phylum, they are arthropods, or in the phylum Arthropoda. Uh, so this includes basically all bugs. So any, you know, creepy crawlies you could say that have uh, an exoskeleton and segmented body parts. So these are all your insects, spiders, scorpions. Um, they're all within that arthropod group. So that's where butterflies fall as well. So we go a little lower to the class. They are of course insects. Um, so they have three segmented body parts, uh, the head, thorax, and abdomen, as well as six legs, just like um, all insects. And if we go to the next leg of that, the order, um, they're in the Lepidoptera order. So that's a group that includes all moths and butterflies. And then if we go another leg below that, they're in the family uh, Nymphalidae. So that's a family of butterflies that includes monarchs as well as the uh, swallowtail butterflies. So kind of a lot of these larger uh, nectar feeding butterflies. And then when we go right down to the scientific name, I know it might be hard to pronounce, it's called Dinos plexippus. Uh, that's the scientific name that we use to formally call uh, monarch butterflies. Can you tell us where yeah. they got that scientific name? Was it named after yeah. a person or a... I'm, I'm not entirely okay. sure. Um, it's, I know that the, um, I didn't include this, but the name Monarch Butterfly, I think it was named in honor of a king mm -hmm. in England who I guess was fond of the color orange. So they, uh, they named this butterfly after him. Yeah. And if you guys have any questions throughout this, feel free to stick a hand up, shout out, scream and shout whatever you feel like so all right so just to give a brief description of the monarch butterfly um, as an adult they're roughly four inches in length from uh, this part of the wing to that part so you can imagine they're they're kind of small um, and their wings are actually separated into the forewing this top wing right here and the hind wing so they're like two Kind of separated wings but together they allow the butterfly to fly and you might be wondering what these little lines are right here those are the veins in the butterfly wings um, but they're actually filled with air so they really just give the wings that like stiff uh, structure so that the wings you know stay straight and allows the butterfly to fly um, and of course we've got the antenna sticking out from his head uh, which allows the butterflies to smell and navigate uh, the world around them and uh, drink from flowers as well to drink nectar. Um, and you can't see it here, but butterflies do have these uh, compound eyes, so like these big eyes with little, almost like little hexagons in there, and it allows them to also see the world um, and see even ultraviolet light and colors that we can't see. So they've got pretty Pretty crazy eyes, if you think about it. Um, and the best way to tell apart male and female butterfly, if you look closely here, there's a little black dot right on this hind wing on the vein, right there. So we know that this is a this is a boy. This is a male butterfly. And over there, the female does not have those black dots. So we know that's that's a girl over there. Um, and there is another butterfly species that looks very similar. So the monarch is called the viceroy, and the key difference is that if you see that line going along right there, that, that tells you that that's a viceroy and not a monarch. So it's sometimes hard to tell when they're flying, but when they land on a flower or a blade of grass like that, if you see that line there, you know it's a viceroy butterfly and not a monarch. So. Are viceroys found yep. in this area? They are, yep. They're not uh, not super common, um, but it's I believe they're a little smaller as well. Once you learn to 
get used to seeing the monarchs they uh the viceroys they look a little different they're not as as big you could say all right so jumping into the life cycle we've got the egg so the eggs are laid in the spring and summer um sort of a little earlier you know it looks huge but they're actually a lot smaller uh, but yeah they do have that greenish kind of coloration um, and the butterflies will lay eggs right on the bottom of milkweed leaves uh, usually individually not as these big giant uh, clumps of eggs but uh, they'll usually lay females will lay around 300 to 500 really eggs cool. so yeah ton of eggs for one female and usually after uh, the egg is laid on the leaf, they will probably hatch within three to eight days. Um, so pretty soon. And that it looks big there, but each egg is barely a millimeter in length. So they're extremely tiny out in the wild. So next we've got the larva or caterpillar, as they're better known. Um, so caterpillars and other insects that start out as a larva in life, they actually develop in what we call instar stages. So as the caterpillar grows bigger, it um, enters a new instar stage, so it's closer to becoming an adult. Um, so in the first instar stage of a monarch caterpillar, as soon as they're born, they're actually very, very tiny, only a few millimeters in length. And they have this like light green color, so they don't actually look like that. They're more, almost like an inchworm, just more, more kind of a plain green. And, you know, they still have a long way to go after that. Um, so once they grow a little larger, kind of like a few millimeters larger than that, um, they will shed their skin, their exoskeleton, and they'll have these uh, black and yellow stripes on their body. So they'll start to look more like what we think of when we picture a monarch caterpillar. So after that, they are, they're basically eating this whole time too. So this guy, he doesn't, he doesn't do much with his life. He's really just eating away at milkweed uh, so that he can get ready to be a butterfly. Uh, but after that second instar stage, we'll keep eating, shed that skin again, and get even more of these black and white stripes. Uh, have a more vibrant coloration and the uh the tentacles as you can see on the head and back here near the abdomen will get much longer which allows them to uh, sense the world around them to smell uh, to know when there's a danger present so it um, it makes them more like a butterfly they kind of looks like antenna but not quite uh, but it better prepares them to navigate and see the world better and um, be more wary of predators. Uh, so when we that caterpillar keeps eating, sheds the skin again, enters the fourth instar stage, it gets these white spots on the pro legs here, if you can see. So these are not, they're not actually legs, they're called pro legs um, or fake legs, if you will. Uh, but they basically just allow the butterfly to, not the butterfly, the caterpillar, to walk. Because this guy's pretty long. If he just has six legs, he can't walk pretty well. So he needs those extra legs to keep him moving and uh, keep him feeding. So after that, once he enters the fifth instar stage, keeps eating, sheds that exoskeleton again, he's nice and fat. He's plump. Those true legs... These are the six legs that all insects have, are really tight and close to his head. So this one is just about ready to uh, go on to the next stage and yeah, get closer to being a butterfly. So. Does the caterpillar have eyes? He does, yeah. He's got smaller compound eyes, but uh, they're not like big like the butterfly, so he can't see very well. And that's what the tentacles are for, so he can kind of know what's going on around him. So it's, the eyes are there, but they're, he doesn't have good eyesight right now. So, and he doesn't have glasses, so that's why he needs the, you know, the things. So, so, do you guys know what the next stage is? Chrysalis. Chrysalis, you got it. Got the chrysalis. Here I call it the pupa, but you're right, it's definitely called the chrysalis. 
as you can see here, this green structure right there. So when he's ready to pupate or form the chrysalis, he crawls onto a diagonal surface like a branch or a leaf going this way and begins to hang like that from his back legs to form that, uh, that hook shape. So he'll be ready to um, form the chrysalis. Did I see your hand right there? I realized that yeah. they have little dots. Wow. They do, yeah. Those, um, I can't remember the purpose of those dots. They, um, I believe they are a, an early form of the dots that you see on the adult butterfly there, right there. So that's, that's why all the dots appear when it's in a green chrysalis like that. So you could say those are like the baby dots, like they're not the adult dots that the butterfly has on the wing. But um, yeah, that's a good question. So, once this guy is hanging like that, he, uh, he stays like that for a while, about 12 to 16 hours. And eventually he enters this phase, it's another big word here, called peristalsis. So this is when the caterpillar moves his body muscles around to help remove his exoskeleton again. So that, um, and I'll show you guys in a moment, once he sheds that exoskeleton, his skin basically looks like that. So that chrysalis, that green structure around him, that's actually the caterpillar's skin. So kind of creepy, kind of alien-like, but uh, that's what he looks like once he's almost ready to be a butterfly. So once it forms this chrysalis, it is uh, soft at first, and then usually within a day, it'll harden and stiffen up like a rock. So. It'll stay like that for about uh, 8 to 15 days. Uh, and then about a day before he's ready to pop right out, the green coloration will go away and it'll be transparent like that. So he'll, at this point, he'll almost be a fully grown uh, butterfly. So I've got a video for you guys to show this. For about a dollar a day, this new company is shipping compostable zipper bags Here we and go. giving free trash bags for life. Fact. Americans use over 100 billion plastic bags. At least it's, in, exactly. it's an environmentally friendly <laughs> ad, so <laughs> I guess it's relevant. <laughs> So this one is in the fifth in star stage, the last caterpillar stage, so he's just about ready to roll. crawling out of that skin. He's still very flexible. Uh, the chrysalis hasn't parted yet, so he can still kind of move around a bit, but soon he'll be uh, stiff like this one here. So that green color is gone, and now this guy's ready to pop right out. So.
there's the butterfly. Okay, get that out of here. All right, so as you guys have seen, uh, this is now the adult butterfly that has just crawled out of the chrysalis. Um, so when they first crawl out, they're actually kind of uh, wet for a couple of hours. Their wings are all crinkly and they're not ready to fly. Uh, but usually they have to stay still like that for a couple of hours so that the hemolymph, which is actually the blood in bugs, um, can flow through their body and through their wings so that those wings will straighten out and then the butterfly will be all ready to fly off and do what butterflies do, which is to seek out flowering plants so that they could drink nectar. Because that's, that's what sustains them. Um, they have a, a kind of like a straw mouth, like a proboscis. So kind of like a fruit roll up that goes, it rolls up when they're flying, but when they want to drink from a flower, it unravels just like a straw and it goes right down into the cup of a flower and they drink up that sugary nectar um, as if it's a smoothie, so. All right, this is a cool one. So after the butterfly's been drinking nectar here and there for a while, um, they're ready to migrate. So uh, the first generation of butterflies actually uh, begins in, or usually migrates down to Mexico for the winter because up here it's way too cold for them to survive. Uh, but down in Mexico, they have uh, these warm forests they can live in. They can drink nectar while they're there and get ready to lay eggs. So during the springtime, these guys will start to make their way back up north. So the first generation will go kind of through Texas into the southern states there, and they will uh, begin to lay eggs. So the next generation will make its way north, uh, almost into the northeast, and lay eggs. And then the next generation from there, the last one, uh, makes its way into Canada or up here into Massachusetts or Maine, as you can see up there. And that, gener that one right there, the fourth generation, uh, that's the longest lived of the adult caterpillars or adult butterflies. So that, that last generation that we have up here, they actually live the longest. They live for nine months. So what they do is when the fall comes, it's getting a little colder, they have to make their way all the way back down to Mexico to start the cycle all over again. So that way they could, you know, stay warm, uh, avoid the winter and keep the cycle going again. So that we have monarchs here every uh, spring and summer. All right, and I've got a, another video for you right here. Oh. I know. I know. No one wants to hear about school, right? We're not there yet. I know. The largest insect migration in the world ends each year in Michoacan, Mexico. Millions of monarch butterflies travel from across the U.S. and Canada. Some flying close to 3,000 miles to pass the cold months in the towering trees of this beautiful forest. Okay, so yeah, and um, 
So here in the east, we have a bit of a more complicated migration that has four generations. Uh, but out west, it's they kind of have a, have a little shorter route. So I believe it's a few less generations they have. Uh, but some of them will often actually go to Southern California. They won't make it all the way to Mexico because it's down in sunny California. It's also warm, so they don't need to go all the way to Mexico. Uh, but if you saw all those millions of butterflies on the trees, um, I've heard stories of branches of trees actually breaking because there are just so many. The weight of these butterflies is actually so heavy that sometimes the trees can't even take it. So you can imagine just how many uh, make that journey. All right, so speaking of migration, um, there has been some research done by scientists uh, down south in Georgia that have looked into the spots on butterflies' wings. And they looked at about 400 different uh, monarch butterfly um, individuals and looked at the colors, the spots, uh, the blackness on the edge of the wings. And they, uh, in doing their research, they found that a lot of the butterflies that successfully made the journey to Mexico, they actually had much larger white spots on their wings. Um, so it's believed, and they don't know yet, this is very uh, new information, so they don't know the whole story yet, but it's believed that the contrast of all these white spots with the, um, the blackness around the wing actually helps decrease air resistance as they fly. So this allows them to make such a long migration, being like 3,000 miles. So it's believed that um, that color scheme allows them to travel uh, much longer distances because there's less uh, drag or air resistance going against their wings. And they feel this way because a lot of birds actually, um, especially seabirds, if you look at like seagulls, they have sort of these black tip wings. Um, it's believed that that darker color takes in a little more sunlight and actually helps decrease air resistance as they fly. So that helps birds fly very long distances. And these scientists, they think that allows butterflies to fly really long distances as well. But this is all still very new. So, you know, we'll see what the scientists say in a little, in the near future. It could be a different story, but uh, that's what they think right now. So I've mentioned it a few times, but we've got a number of host plants for the monarchs. So of course, milkweed is what the caterpillars feed on. Um, these are sort of the three main species of milkweed we have up here. Uh, you guys have, may have seen them a little bit, especially along highways in these open grassy areas. We've got common milkweed right here. They have these big oval shaped, uh, almost leathery or fuzzy looking leaves to them. And uh, this is one of the most preferred species of milkweed by the monarchs because it has this very milky white sap to it that the caterpillars really like. Um, and especially at this time of year, kind of going, sort of going into August, into the fall, you can see these big purple, purplish pink flowers um, as well. So as the season goes on, just keep an eye out, you might see those flowers uh, pretty soon. Um, so right next to it, we've got the swamp milkweed as well. Uh, that also produces those large pink flowers. Um, except the leaves are very uh, oblong shaped. They're very long, skinny, and pointed. And the sap is not quite as milky, uh, but the caterpillars also really love that swamp milkweed, um, which as you can tell by the name swamp, they kind of grow in these wetter areas uh, in this more like wet, soggy soil. Um, so that's often where you'll find the swamp milkweed. And last, we've got the butterfly milkweed perfectly named, of course. Um, it is more similar to the swamp milkweed because the leaves also are very long and have that pointed shape, um, except they have these bright orange flowers. So that's the key difference between uh, those two milkweed types when you're looking at them. But usually monarchs prefer these two because the sap has a higher quality uh, nutrition to it, which I'll get into a little later. So, all right, 
how big is big and scary. Here we go. These are the predators of monarchs. Uh, these are not the friends of monarchs. This is what they got to watch out for when they're flying about in the wild. Uh, so of course we've got birds that will often feed on the caterpillars when they're young and may even attack and try to eat the adult butterflies as well. Um, and of course we've got ants, wasps, and spiders, some arthropod predators, and the milkweed assassin bug too, that will all attack and feed on the caterpillars when they're on the milkweed. So some of these predators uh, might be deterred a little bit by the poisons, but usually some of these specialist predators like the milkweed assassin bug, they don't care. They'll, they'll chow down on those caterpillars if they find them. So if a caterpillar runs into one of these guys, they're kind of out of luck. But, so it's usually not all doom and gloom though. Uh, they do have uh, certain toxins that they ingest as they feed on milkweed. So one reason that the monarchs love the common milkweed, like the milkweed with the big leathery leaves, is that it contains, in its white milky sap, it contains uh, these alkaloids, which are very nitrogen-rich materials that, as the caterpillar feeds on it and brings it into its body, it actually ingests a poison. So it basically becomes poisonous as it eats these um, as it eats these alkaloids. So they also exhibit what is called aposomatic coloration, another big word. And this basically is a warning to predators that those bright black and yellow uh, stripes that they have, that's a warning to predators saying, I'm poisonous, do not eat me, or you will regret it later on. <laughs> and we can see here in this picture, this blue jay, has decided to eat a, eat a monarch butterfly. He's chowing down, but later on you could see that blue jay actually ends up regurging the butterfly uh, later on. So that blue jay has eaten the butterfly, ingested the poison, and got sick from it. So these monarch butterflies, they're no good. You don't want to eat them. But this blue jay had to learn that the hard way. Um, <laughs> So in this way, the birds actually, birds actually do a pretty good memory in terms of um, experiences they have eating food. So this blue jay had a pretty bad experience eating this butterfly, so he's not gonna eat them again. So when this happens, uh, birds actually end up avoiding monarch butterflies so that other butterflies will be spared and they won't, um, they're not as likely to get attacked and eaten by these birds. So usually this, well, this guy unfortunately did not make it, uh, usually more monarch butterflies will be able to get away because this bird, he's not gonna try that again after having eaten this one. So uh, why do we care about monarchs? Um, just looking at their ecological importance, so uh, looking at why they're important for the environment around us and other animals and living things. So just like other uh, butterflies and bees, monarchs are pollinators. So as they drink nectar from flowers, uh, they'll often accidentally kick up the pollen from uh, flowering plants. And as they fly from one flowering plant to another, they'll redistribute that pollen so that um, the pollen helps fertilize plants, uh, plants can produce seeds, and make more plants. So butterflies are, and monarchs especially, are extremely important in that process. They help flowers reproduce, they spread the pollen, uh, they help in seed production. So these butterflies help make, help keep our gardens healthy, uh, keep crops healthy, and a lot of wild flowers thriving. So we love monarchs for that reason. Um, they also, as mentioned before, uh, they are an important food source for a number of species. Uh, we don't love to see them get eaten, but of course some birds um, depend on them if they could get the pass the poison. A lot of arthropods like the spiders, the assassin bugs, ants, wasps, uh, they do benefit from eating those caterpillars. So they can, um, for those species, they are important. 
So monarchs, they're connected to so many other animals as well. And also, there is, um, they are what we call an umbrella species. So when we take the time and effort to study monarch butterflies and try to protect them, um, we're also protecting habitat for a wide variety of different species. So many, when we protect these grasslands and milkweed for monarch butterflies, a lot of other butterflies will be happy too because they also need uh, flowering plants like the milkweed. They love wildflowers as well. Uh, so when we decide to protect monarchs, we protect all kinds of animals as well. All right, so looking at the conservation concerns, uh, we're a little worried about monarch butterflies, not gonna lie. They have been, um, their populations have gone down a little bit, so there are a lot less monarchs than there used to be. Um, so scientists at the University of Wisconsin, another big school up north, they actually, for the past 30 years, they've looked at that wintering site in Mexico where all the butterflies go to see how much land is being occupied by the monarch butterflies. And what they found is between 2021 and 2022, during the winter, they found that the amount of land occupied uh, by these butterflies has actually declined by uh, 20, more than 20%. So there's a lot less uh, land in this wintering area in Mexico where we're seeing the butterflies. So, which is a, a big concern. We're, uh, you know, we want these butterfly populations to be up and so we can enjoy them and they can help our environment. But it's, it's looking a little shaky right now. Um, some threats to their survival that we've seen have been habitat loss. So as we continue to build highways, roadways, um, and expand agriculture, farmland, sometimes this land development can change the landscape in a way that's not good for butterflies. So there could be less flowering plants available uh, due to habitat loss and less milkweed. So it's believed that that's why we're seeing a lot less uh, butterflies out there now. And oftentimes in agriculture on farmland, we like to use a lot of pesticides to get rid of any bad pests that could be eating our crops, um, which is good for our crops, but sometimes it actually negatively affects these uh, beneficial insects like butterflies. So the widespread use of pesticides is also believed to be a reason why monarchs have been on the low lately. <laughs> So, but it's not all doom and gloom. There's a little bit, some things we can do to help. Uh, the biggest thing is to plant milkweed. So if you know your area and you know what species of milkweed we have in our area, uh, the common milkweed is the best to use. As you can see in that top right-hand corner, um, that's a milkweed seed pod. So those uh, brown things you can see there, those are the actual seeds that will grow into the plant once you put it into the ground. So usually around uh, fall time into like September and October, milkweed will produce these seed pods and eventually those seed pods will dry out and they'll crack right open. So all that milkweed is free flowing in the world, it's flying out there and it's starting a new generation of milkweed uh, so that the caterpillars can feed on it in the spring. So if you want to plant your own milkweed and help these butterflies out, it's uh, recommended that you plant the seeds in uh, sometime in autumn in like September, October, so that in the spring you could see that milkweed come right up and hopefully you might find some caterpillars on it um, after that. And this is because the seeds actually need to undergo freezing winter temperatures in order to be triggered to germinate. Um, to sprout from the ground. So it's recommended that doing this in the fall is the best time uh, for this. Um, so if you can't find any milkweed seeds on your own, sometimes it's a little difficult. Um, you can look into any local plant nurseries that have them. Sometimes they do have the seeds or uh, actual milkweed plants. So doing your research, looking for a nursery or finding milkweed seeds on your own is a good approach to help 
plant milkweed and uh, help these butterflies out. And by doing this, you're not only helping monarch butterflies, you're helping a wide variety of animals as well, other butterfly species, birds, insects, um, you know, all these animals, they often love these landscapes that have a lot of different plants on them. So by doing this, you're not only helping the monarchs, but you're helping bugs, birds, spiders, all sorts of critters out. So we love milkweed for that reason. <laughs> So other notable butterfly species we have in our area, we love the monarchs, they get a lot of attention, but these are also some other pretty cool species we have. So in the top left, we've got the clouded sulfur. You may have seen these. Um, they'll be a little, you'll see them more later on in the season too. They're called clouded sulfurs. Uh, they've got these bright yellow wings and a pretty characteristic white dot right in the middle. Um, so as the season progresses, you might see more of these guys flying around in open grassy areas, uh, feeding on flowering plants as well. And of course, right here, we've got the American copper and bronze copper. Those are very tiny butterflies, not much larger than a dime, actually. Um, and they only live, those ones only live for a few days. Um, so you usually see those kind of in the summer going into the fall as well. Uh, but those are a lot harder. They're easier to miss because they're so tiny and they're very quick too. So right here, I'm sure you guys have been seeing these ones around. Uh, this is the cabbage white butterfly. They're found, um, they're actually from Europe originally, but you know, as people started coming over here to the US from Europe, we accidentally brought these guys over as well. So the cabbage white, they're not bad here. It's okay that they're here. Uh, they're not invasive, as we say, but uh, they are here. So if you're in your backyard or on an open lawn and you see these white butterflies flying around, which I'm sure you have, um, just know it's a cabbage white you're looking at. And of course, we've got the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail uh, in that same family as Monarch, these big, uh, big butterflies we have. You'll see those flying around as well in forests um, and in open fields too and the even slightly rarer black swallowtail butterfly, also in that same uh, monarch family. Um, but you'll see those guys flying around in forests as well, high up in the canopy, uh, pretty low, or in open fields as well. And butterflies, they've all got the same mission, drink nectar from flowers, make caterpillars, and start the cycle again. So, yeah. Uh, so if you want to find out more, uh, I've got some other resources to look at. There is the Massachusetts Butterfly Club. I can open it up quickly too. It's a sort of a group we have, kind of a club in Massachusetts that does some work looking at butterfly populations in the state. So they take, this group kind of takes the time. They do butterfly surveys. Um, they'll lead you on a butterfly walk if you want to do that and they um, do education programs too. So they, they'll teach you about the importance of butterflies, where to find them, how to protect them, um, because we need butterflies. <laughs> and right here, we've also got the North American Butterfly Association, uh, which is really just like our Massachusetts Butterfly Club, but it's on a much bigger scale. So they're found across the country. Uh, they do programs teaching us about butterflies, where to find them, how to protect them, same idea. So you can, you can become a member, uh, get involved and help out with these butterfly surveys, um, or you can teach your friends about butterflies too. <laughs> so that, that's all I have for you guys, but uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks.